Amen. It is good to be in the house of God on Wednesday night. So glad to be back home. So glad uh, that God has given us this wonderful opportunity to come into the house of God one more time and to magnify his name. We had a wonderful trip in St. Louis. Um, So much was accomplished while we were there. And I'm just so happy and appreciative that God allowed us to be a part of that. And, uh, and, and looking forward to many more times of, of God moving <coughs> and helping uh, because this church has got a mandate on it. And we've got to, we got to, we got to do what we've got to do, saints. And uh, so we're going to reach this area and we're going to reach every area that God will allow us to put our foot down on. And uh, I do thank God for all of you. I know that uh, several are not here tonight that were here this weekend, but for all of you that were here Wednesday night, I know Sister Shonda, Brother Chris, Sister Laverne, uh, those of you that were here this weekend, that held down the fort this weekend while we were gone, I know it was probably very awkward without having all of us here, maybe, uh, but I thank you for being here, and I thank you for, uh, Brother Jonathan Malone did an outstanding job last Wednesday night bringing forth a word, uh, Brother Joe uh, did a great job Sunday morning. And uh, so you all were well fed while I was gone, and that's the important part. Amen? But tonight, we're going to worship the Lord. Uh, We are going to take communion tonight. Uh, We'll do it at the end of service. And uh, I just encourage you, while we're worshiping and while the music is going, uh, if there's anything that you need to work on your heart between you and the Lord, let's make sure we take care of that, because the Bible said we are not to uh, eat the bread or drink the cup unworthily. And so let's make sure that our hearts are right and our minds are right. And then we will come and we will remember the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. So tonight we're going to do that. We're going to hear from the word of God. We're going to worship. It's just going to be an awesome night in the presence of the Lord. And I'm just thankful to be able to be here. So let's just go before the Lord. Lord, we thank you so much that you have given us this wonderful opportunity to be here tonight. We thank you, O oh God, that we have been able to be called into this place to worship you in the beauty of holiness. We pray that you would have your way in this place. God, move according to your own good pleasure. Let the will of God be done in our midst as it is in the heavens. God, I pray for myself. I can't pray for anybody else, Lord, in this way, but I pray for myself, God, that if there is anything in me, oh God, Lord, that any sin, any iniquity, oh God, that would be found in me, oh God, that you would wash me by the blood and that you would cleanse me, God, that I would not take of this cup, Lord, or this bread unworthy, Lord, but unworthily, but wash me, God, and purify me thoroughly, oh God, that when we go to that time of worship, Lord, we will do, God, with full hearts, Lord God, and a pure conscience. Oh, God, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would touch every song that will be sung tonight. I pray that you would touch the musicians, God. I pray that you would touch your word tonight, God. Speak to us in a mighty way. Speak to us in a powerful way, God, Lord, on this evening, Lord. And we will not cease to give you praise, but we'll be careful to honor you in all of these things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Let's worship the Lord tonight, saints. Yeah. 
to God. If you never do anything else, Lord, you've already done enough. Oh, if you never do anything else, you've already done enough. You've already done enough. I mean, you can say that in your heart. If you never do anything else, you've already done enough. You've already done. Amen. While this spirit of worship is here, I know Wednesday night we normally wait to the end to take the offering. But I also uh, I also don't want to hinder the communion. We're going to do the communion at the very end. Um, and I want that to be the last thing we do before we leave. Um, I believe in the scripture. After they took the communion, they quietly went out. Um, and I, I just want us to remember you know I see a lot of churches my goodness you see them and they've got Easter egg hunts and food trucks and I see I hope you don't take your kids Easter egg hunting this week I hope you don't if you understood the pagan custom of that go and look go and look how they've painted the first eggs They did it with the blood of children that they offered. Go look. Your kids are not going to miss out on anything if they don't hunt Easter eggs. Has nothing to do with us. Has nothing to do with us. It's pagan. it's, It's just as pagan as Santa Claus. Come on. Don't take your kids Easter egg hunting. I'm going to do a flyer. You're going to see it tomorrow. It's going to say, come celebrate Resurrection Sunday at New Destiny where there will be no Easter egg hunts, no food trucks, no icy carts. It's just going to be the gospel and worship and celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ because that's what it's really about. Amen. Don't take your kids and sit them on the bunny's lap. has nothing to do with us. In fact, Easter is not even a word we should be using. You say, well, it's in the Bible. That's because the Roman Catholics put it in there. Easter is a goddess of fertility. We don't celebrate the goddess of fertility. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I promise you, your kids are... Listen, you'll have one less photo of them screaming their guts out if you don't take them and put them on this bunny's lap, all right? Ain't no child believes that there's a real big bunny out there like that, and anything like that just scares them to death. We're going to celebrate the death of Christ, the burial of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ this week because this is what it's really about. There'll be no food trucks here. Amen. There'll be no icy trucks here. There'll be no bouncy houses here. I'm not turning the church into a mall where we put on the very best frontal view so that the church shoppers can figure out if they like our style or not. The word of God better draw people and the spirit of God better draw people or we won't keep them. And so this week, don't entertain none of that junk. Just don't entertain it. Don't entertain none of it. In fact, I'm going to tell you what, we're we're not going to have school good Friday. And I hope you parents don't use it as a day to take your kids to the park and just have a good time with it. If you don't sit down and talk to them about the death of Christ and what that meant, good Friday doesn't mean anything to you doesn't mean anything to you. It's just another day off. This is our week, guys. This is our week. The Muslims have theirs. The Hindus have theirs. The Buddhists have theirs. This is our week. We're the only true and living Savior. Hallelujah. He's not in a tomb like Buddha. He's not in a mausoleum like Muhammad. There is no grave that can hold him. There is no stone that could withstand him but he got up and he is now seated at the right hand of the majesty on high this is our week this is our week don't let the pagans come in and ruin our week don't let pagan traditions come in and 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 i know you're going to want to dress your children real sharp on sunday but let's also make sure that that doesn't cloud 
what this day is really about. It is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when he raised saints of God, we were forever justified to God. And we're waiting to be glorified. So don't get into all the pagan stuff. I see churches trying to market their churches this week. I think you ought to be preaching the gospel. Forget marketing this junk. Just preach the word. And the spirit of the Father will draw them. Amen? But because I don't want this interrupted, we're going to worship in our giving right now. Tithes, offerings. Amen. Let the Lord touch your heart. Give liberally. If you haven't had a chance to give your tithes yet, I know some of us were in St. Louis. Amen. I hope you didn't use that on eating out. Glory to God. Got mine right here. You know, interesting enough, that right here, in my hand, there it goes again. You see, $60. I looked on the ring camera, couldn't see anybody last night. Sister Chandra came here, and underneath the rug, there was $60 sitting there. I don't even know who gave this. I have no clue how this came to, I, there is nobody on the ring camera. Ken, it wasn't here when you were here last night, was it? <laughs> $60. I have no clue who gave it. But God put it on somebody's heart to come by this church last night and put $60 under the rug. So if you want to give online, you can. Amen. If you want to give in person, you can. I had somebody call me uh, Monday coming back, and they said, Brother Jared, we saw what y'all did in St. Louis. Give us your address. We're going to send your church an offering. It's how God works. So we're going to give because we get to. I've got my tithes. I've got the $60. And I pray God will bless whoever gave that. I don't know who did it, but I pray they get an abundant blessing. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for your loving kindness and your tender mercy. We thank you that you have drawn us into this place. We thank you for the opportunity to be able to sow into your kingdom. I pray for those who are giving right now that you would bless them as they give. Watch over your word to perform it concerning them and bless them abundantly. Oh, God, we thank you for this time to just give back something to you, Lord, because you have been so good to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. All right, brothers, come, let's receive the offering of the Lord. presence of the Lord. Amen. Lord, I better turn my ringer off. <laughs> that was me, y'all. Jared, turn your ringer off. This is a church. Have some respect. So now you got to rebuke yourself because <laughs> y'all know I'd have been rebuking you if it was you. So good for the goose, good for the gander, right? But it is so good to be in the house of God tonight. So thankful for his presence. Good to be back home. I, I will tell you, we, we just came out of a sanctuary that was seat over 2,000 people. And, and my, my ears are adjusting right now because <laughs> it, uh, it was a very different sound when we were there. Um, but it is good to be here. In fact, I walked in here Monday. You know, we had been in uh, service since Thursday night. And I walked in here Monday. And I walked in, or Tuesday rather. And I thought, whoa. It just seemed really small at that point to me, <laughs> but it is good to be back. So thankful. We, we had such an awesome time this weekend. We bonded so greatly. God moved in such a great way, and uh, I'm looking for our ministry to be far more effective both in this city and in other cities as well. God's setting us up with 
uh, ministry to be able to do in a lot of places. And we've got a lot of preachers and a lot of people that can take care of that kind of business. And uh, so we thank God for that. Um, they were so grateful. Uh, and, and for those of you that stayed behind and were faithful, man, I, I just I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Amen. For for being for being here. Um, I didn't want I didn't want to close the doors. It's not good to close the doors. And then we had some ladies here, I guess, Sunday morning. Uh, amen. Some some guests. Uh, so we thank God for that. Look at that. That's why we kept the doors open. Right. That's why we kept the doors open. Hopefully they'll be back here this Sunday. Um, and then Sunday morning is going to be resurrection morning. It is a wonderful opportunity for you all to be able to invite people. And so invite people to come to church with you on Sunday. Um, you know, we come to this time of year every year, and it seems redundant because we're going to talk about the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But this is always a good time of year to just kind of return to making the main thing the main thing and, 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 and what it's all about. Um, sometimes we get caught up with life and we forget what it's about. Sometimes we get caught up with circumstance and situations and we forget what it's all about. Sometimes we get ambitious and we forget what it's all about. But this is all about the Lord. This is all about Jesus Christ and what he did for us on Calvary. So I want you to go to Isaiah 53 with me. You all know this scripture. Many of you all could probably quote this scripture by heart. But Isaiah 53 and verse 1. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. This is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. Hundreds and hundreds of years before he would ever come. And that's the reason why I'm telling you, saints, if it, it, it's almost impossible for people to think that Jesus was not real and he was not who he said he was. Because he fulfilled everything. Every word of prophecy that was ever spoken about him in the Old Testament, nothing was left unfulfilled. And some might say, yeah, but he was controlling all of that. All right, what about when he was on the cross? And the prophecy went forth that none of his bones shall be broken. He's hanging up on the cross, and they were coming with a mallet. They would come with a mallet after a while, and they would break the legs of those who were on the cross and that would cause them to suffocate and expire. But before they could get to him, he yielded up the ghost and he passed. So that not one of his bones would be broken. He had no control over that. But he fulfilled that prophecy as well. It is absolutely impossible to think that he was not who he was. He was the son of God. In fact, he was so convinced that one of the Roman soldiers that stood at his cross, it was so convincing. That one of the Roman soldiers that stood at his cross, one of, one of the men who obviously were there to make sure he died, looked up and said, surely this was the son of God. And we should be more convinced because not only do we have the history, not only do we have the knowledge, but we have the experience of what the Lord does in our lives when we give our life to him and allow him to change us completely. And so it says, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So I want you all to understand the pretty Jesuses that they put in the movies. That's just cinematic. Amen. Most people rejected him because he was not. He wouldn't look like one of the uh, one of the Sadducees or one of the Pharisees. He wouldn't look like one of the synagogue, the rulers of the synagogue. There was nothing about him that was desirous or comely. And the Bible says, surely he hath borne our griefs. Thank you, God. Or he was despised and rejected a man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our, sorrow, our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He came to bear our sin, our sorrow, our griefs. And all they could see is that he was under the judgment of God. That it was God's will that he should die. 
because he was under God's wrath and judgment for being a blasphemer. The Bible says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. These are prophecies that were going forward ages before Jesus would ever arrive on the scene. That he would stand there and when they were questioning him, he would just keep quiet. That he wouldn't open his mouth or utter a word. These things were happening in real time in front of them and they had the book of prophecies. And yet they could not see him. He was taken from prison and judgment. Judgment hall to judgment hall. From Pilate's judgment seat to Herod's judgment seat. From Herod's judgment seat back to Pilate's judgment seat. I mean, this is all right here. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked. Can you imagine that? Because the wages of sin is death. He allowed himself to take upon himself the iniquity of us all. And God looked upon him as a transgressor for the sin that was laid upon him. Not his sin, but our sin, our iniquity, our unrighteousness, our ungodliness. And because of what was laid upon him, he made his bed in the grave like he had sinned himself. And with the rich in his death, because we know that Joseph of Arimathea allowed him to borrow that tomb. He was a wealthy man, a rich man, who had just hewed out that tomb, bought that. And Jesus was laid there. It's all through the word of God. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. Can you imagine that, saints? For he shall bear their iniquities. There will I, therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he has poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with transgressors. He was hanging there with two thieves. And he bare the sin of many. And made in- intercession for the transgressors. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Right here. How could you read this and not know who Jesus was? Not see him so very clearly. It was, this is the picture. Painted plainly. Of the suffering that he would endure. And of the pain that would be afflicted upon him because of my iniquity. And I want to talk to you out of this tonight. From this subject, had it not been. Had it not been. Because I think sometimes we do take for granted the fact that Christ had to suffer for us. He had no sin. He knew no iniquity. He he had never done an unrighteous thing in his life. In fact, the enemy came to tempt him in all points. Like as we are tempted, and yet he committed no sin. He was perfect and blameless, the sinless son of God the perfect and spotless and unblemished lamb of God. In fact, John declared him when he was coming to be baptized of John in the Jordan, and John said, Behold the lamb of God 
which taketh away the sin of the world. And this Jesus had to do this for us. Because we all know that no matter how good we would try to be, at best we are unrighteous, we are wicked, sinful, ungodly, unholy. At very best, we are without hope. At very best, we have absolutely no promise of a future after this because if we have sinned in any point, we are guilty of every law. If we have sinned in any point, we are guilty of all transgressions. And no matter if all you ever did was do one thing, no matter if all you ever did was sin one time, because you are guilty, because you have been convicted by the law of God as a guilty sinner, then we are all worthy of death. For the reward of sin is death. And so he took upon himself the iniquity of us all. He became the scapegoat for all of us. He went outside of the city and bore the sin of all humanity. And in the Old Testament, when they would send the scapegoat out as a symbol of the sin leaving Israel, it would come back. But this time, the scapegoat was going to have to die. And when that priest would take the sin and he would lay his hands on the scapegoat and he would confess the sin of the people over that scapegoat, that sin was imputed upon that animal. And that animal bearing the iniquity of all of Israel, they would loose him and he would run outside of the gate. And that is exactly what God did to Christ. He became the scapegoat for me. He became the scapegoat for me. I'll never forget when Brother Don Slusher was saved. At the, I think he was 85 years old when he came to the Lord. And I'll never forget the Wednesday night that he came up to me in tears, feeling the convicting power of the Spirit of God on his life. And he looked at me and he said, But Brother Jared, are you sure that God can forgive a man like me who has done so many wicked things? And I said, Brother Don, God specializes in forgiving men like you. Because long before you ever transgressed, long before you ever sinned, long before you ever committed iniquity, The Lord had already had the iniquity of us all put upon him. The gate of the city had already opened and they already led the scapegoat out of the city up to the hill of Golgotha. And on that cross, the sinless, spotless, perfect lamb of God suffered atrocity and shame and embarrassment. Because I I know that that they they try to almost pretty it up even even the passion didn't do it justice. They did well, but they didn't do it justice. Because I could tell you he had no loincloth on him while he was hanging on that cross. They stripped him completely naked. And the sinless, spotless, perfect, unblemished, beautiful lamb of God hung in absolute shame and embarrassment on that cross. Because had it not been, you and I are still without God having no hope in this world. We are still in our sins. There's no hope for justification, no hope for forgiveness, no hope for redemption for us or anyone else that has ever existed in the human event. Because the writer tells us that the blood of bulls and goats was never sufficient. Never sufficient to cleanse the sinner from his iniquity. 
All it was was a symbol and a type of the Christ that would come and bear that iniquity himself. And all those sacrifices and offerings did was push their sin forward to Calvary. That's all it did. Because had Christ not died, none of them would have been forgiven. Their sacrifices would have been in vain. Those animals would have been slaughtered for absolutely no reason at all. But I'm so thankful that we stand here today and you sit here today with full assurance in your heart knowing that Jesus absolutely went to the cross of Calvary as my scapegoat, bore my iniquity, took himself outside of the gate of the city, and he bore the reproach of every man and every woman and every child. And it was not a beautiful thing. It was not a serene thing. It was a sobering and violent execution of an innocent man. When they took him and they tied him to the post and beat him mercilessly, 39 times with a cat of nine tails, nine strands of a whip, Inside of those strands were bone and metal and glass. And when they would hit him, it would dig into his flesh and it would rip his skin and the hide from his body. But by his stripes, God, I am healed. Hallelujah. His body was broken so that mine could be healed. His body was mutilated so mine could be made whole. Could God in heaven. But had it not been... None of those promises would have been sure to us. Had it not been, none of those promises would have been ours to hold on to. There would be nothing for us to even look toward because we would all just be filthy, rotten heathens serving our idols out, out, out in, and, and offering our children as this heathen world already does unto the ungodly system that it is in. But you and I sit here as born again believers. You and I sit here as blood washed believers. We sit here as Holy Ghost filled believers because the sinless son of God took upon himself the reproach of each one of us and he gladly held it because he knew that the future for you and I would be salvation. The future for you and I would be redemption. The future for you and I would be the remission of sins, the forgiveness of iniquity. That's the reason why when we go to take this bread and this cup, don't do it haphazardly. Don't do it recklessly. But remember, this is my body which is broken for your sake. This is my blood in the new covenant that was poured out for you. Oh, I'm so thankful that Jesus didn't leave any of us out because he didn't die for the Jew only, but he died for every man and every woman, every child that would ever live for the body. Bible said he died not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. I'm so thankful because had it not been, had it not been, no hope for your children. You watch this world recklessly running around, heathen, ungodly, vile. My dear Lord. There was a parade, I think, somewhere in, 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 it was either in South America or Europe. And they had a woman dressed up as Mary walking in the parade, aborting Jesus. Blasphemy and heresy. Evil iniquity. That's the reason why I'm telling you, you need to go back. You need to go back and see why them eggs are painted. The first eggs to be painted were painted with the blood of children. It has nothing to do with us. It has nothing to do with us. Well, my kids, will, my kids will feel like they're less than. My kids won't feel like they fit in. They're not supposed to. And you better make them comfortable right now with being those who don't fit in because you can't just allow them to celebrate every custom and then expect when they become adults to say, you know what? I don't want to fit in anymore. You're teaching them right now that if they have to do without anything that the world has, that they're less than. If you have to have them celebrate this stuff, you're teaching them that without that, they're less than. 
but something on the inside of us has to say, oh, Lord, oh, God, help me, Jesus. Help me, dear Lord, to be right. Help me, dear Lord, to be holy. Help me, dear Lord, to do right. Help me to teach my children right. Help me to make sure that that they're doing is right. Help me, Lord, not to take the customs of this heathen world and intermingle it with my face so that my children don't feel like that they're missing out on something. But help me to make it right to them and help me to make it real to them. This was not pretty. This was not beautiful. This was not something to just wash over or to, you know, to just happen through. This was a horrible sacrifice. This was a man taking upon himself a sin that he had never committed. This is a man allowing the father to, to, to put upon him reproach that he never ever earned so that you and I could walk free tonight of the sin that so easily bound us of the weights that so easily tied us up we can go now today free because of the sacrifice and the death of Jesus Christ on the cross and that ought to make us praise him that ought to make us worship him that ought to make us magnify him that ought to make us glorify him because children of God we now know what it means that what it means for someone who did who, who looked upon us who am I who am I who is I how did I deserve that I didn't deserve the sacrifice I didn't deserve that what did I do to earn that I don't care how many good deeds I could do it could never make up for the sin of my life But the Lord, knowing if I don't do this, if I don't finish this, and he said I could call 10,000 legions of angels, and they would come rescue me. But there was something inside of him that knew if this does not happen, there's no salvation. The Bible said if Christ is not raised, ye are dead and in your sins. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. None of this means anything. But I'm so thankful that the Lord looked at a nobody and was willing to die for me like I was somebody. I'm so thankful that the Lord looked at someone unworthy and was willing to die for me like somebody who had deserved it. Oh, God. The Bible says scarcely for a a rich man or a righteous man would a man die, but God commending his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Had it not been saints, you wouldn't have any knowledge of God. We were just Gentiles, carried away with our dumb idols. If it had not been for him tearing down the middle wall of partition, if it had not been for the sacrifice and the atoning sacrifice of of, of Jesus Christ upon that cross to make sure that you and I could stand before God justified. And one day we will stand before the throne of God glorified. My God. God. But had it not been, there's no sea of glass. Had it not been, there's no first resurrection. Had it not been, there are no rewards. Had it not been, there are no thrones. Had it not been, there's no immortality. Had it not been no forgiveness of sin, no remission of sin. Had it not been there's no church, no body of Christ. Had it not been there's no preaching of the word and there's no gift of the Holy Ghost. All that we have access to now is because of the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And everything that we have to look forward to is because of the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ. And I still believe, without a shadow of a doubt, I don't believe good people go to heaven. Only saved people do. I don't believe people with their good deeds earn their way into the kingdom. I only believe those who are born again go into the kingdom. Because it is not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God. It's grace, saints. It is not because of what we have done, but because of what he has done and what he continues to do in us as we yield ourselves to him. We have no power to be righteous. 
but the Holy Ghost and the grace of God taking the word of God and plowing it deeply into my heart causes the righteousness of Jesus Christ to come alive in my life. And when I hear people say, I am the righteousness of Jesus Christ, yet they fornicate, they lie, they commit adultery, they blaspheme, they backbite, they gossip, they slander and steal. You're not the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And how how dare you? How dare you demean the righteousness of Jesus Christ in saying your behavior because of Christ's death is now acceptable to God? The devil is a liar. Christ didn't come to die to give me peace with sin. He came and died to set me free from sin. That's what this is all about. That's why we do what we do tonight. And that's why we will do what we do tonight. I still believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, no man comes to me except the spirit of my father draw him. He said, no man could come to the father except he come by me. If any man try to come up any other way, that same man's a thief and a robber. Do you believe that? Do you believe that there's only salvation in the name of Jesus Christ? Do you believe firmly in your heart that there is no other name given unto heaven by which we must be saved than the name of Jesus Christ? Not Buddha, not Muhammad, not Allah, none of the gods of the Far Eastern religions, none of the gods of secular humanism, not me, not Mother Earth, not, not human consciousness. There's nothing but the name of Jesus that can save me. It is the only name, the only name, the only name. There's, there's nothing else, saints. There's no other religious system. There's no other sacrifice. You can, you can go into the Far East religions where they mutilate and they, 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 they distort their bodies. They go up into mountains. There, there's one story of a woman who her penance was to go up into a mountain where they would offer their sacrifices to their God. Uh, I think it was even in the Hindu religion. And she took her arm and tied it up above her head. And she walked around that for, 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 I think, almost a month. And when she came down out of the mountain, she had a withered hand and could not move her hand because the blood had rushed from her hand and her hand had withered up. But see, that's their God. Their God withers hands. My Jesus heals the withered hand. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because it is not by my self-mutilation that I am healed. It is not by my self-sacrifice that I am healed. It is by his stripes that I am healed. It's by his blood that I am forgiven. And it is by his resurrection that I am justified. If I truly believe that, then this church should have a greater evangelistic mindset than it's ever had before. If you truly believe that the only way to salvation is through Jesus Christ and you're walking in com the community every day, you're going to work every day, you're, you're around people every day, you're most likely around people that have never, ever known that name of Jesus. You're most likely around somebody that has never repented or been baptized in the name of Jesus. Why would we hold that to ourselves if we believe this is it? If you were if you were in a community and 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 there was coming a great earthquake and you knew that the only way for the community to be saved is for all of them to come out of their houses and to to fill to to file on a boat that was plenty big enough for everyone to ride would you not go around to everybody that you ran into and say, look, the earthquake is coming. Come into the boat. Come on, get in the boat. The earthquake is coming. Your life will not be preserved. Go in now. Come on, let's go into the boat. You have to understand that our job is to pull people out of the fire. Our job is to tell them that there's only one hope for their salvation. And there are a lot of people that will leave this world today that never ever came to salvation. There are a lot of people tomorrow will go, the next day, the next week, the next month, 
My God, saints, let us make sure that everybody God puts us around that doesn't know the name of Jesus. They may not like what we have to say. They might not agree with anything we have to say. And in fact, they might reject us because of what we have to say. But let's make sure we say it anyways. Because you never know who's going to come to the knowledge of the Son of God if we'll just say it anyways. If we'll declare his name anyways. If we'll tell him the gospel anyways. Saints, it's not a difficult road here. It is repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sin and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is not a difficult gospel. It is turning away from your lifestyle of sin. Confessing your sin before the Lord. Allowing the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse you from sin and it is walking in holiness and righteousness which you don't even have to do by your own strength. He gives you strength to do it too. If we believe that, this church ought to be more evangelistic in our mindset. When we were in St. Louis, many of our people and even our children took to the streets of St. Louis and passed out flyers and witnessed and preached to people. And many of them came back and said, we ain't in the Bible Belt no more, Pastor Jared. I said, no, you're in St. Louis. (laughs) We got it pretty easy around here, really. And I was hoping that us understanding that, we would see that if you survived in St. Louis, you'll survive here. But tell somebody about the Lord. Because he was broken for them, too. He died not for our sins only, but for the, not only for those who are saved, but for all those as well who will never be saved. They, they, have, they have a bill paid in full, completely, a bill totally paid in full. And they'll never redeem that because they don't believe. And somebody said, well, Brother Jared, what if they don't believe? Well, there's scripture for that. So if some don't believe, does that make the faith of God without effect? Not everybody's going to believe. Many are called, few are chosen. Not everybody's going to believe. But that few number at the end of the age is so powerful and so great that John said it was a number which no man could number. We have a powerful gospel. That in a heathen Roman world, turned the world completely upside down. Oh, I'm talking about total debauchery. I'm talking about utter heathen practices. What you're seeing right now in 21st century America is really just a repeat of first century Rome. Everything you're seeing right now. They're just repeating what the the culture of first century Rome, that's all. But if in that environment, by the way, which Christians were being put to death as well, they were being tortured and thrown in prisons. If they could turn the world upside down in that environment, what can we do now? And some might say, yeah, but Pastor Jared, it's really dark out there. I mean, it's a dark night out there. That's all right. The darker the night the more brightly and the more brilliantly that the light shines. I want you to start thinking about that when you're in the community, when you're at work, when you're at the department stores. And if you feel that nudge of the Holy Ghost, today I want you to tell some people, go talk to them, go talk to them, go talk to them. Go out with Brother David and them, They say, well, I ain't holding up no signs. That's embarrassing. Are you ashamed of the gospel? Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. It's time for shame and embarrassment to come off of our lives. If Jesus can take my iniquity, be beat and brutalized mercilessly, Hung up on a cross completely naked. Bearing the embarrassment and the shame 
that really was mine to bear, then how could I feel even close to being accepted of him if the very mention of his name in public brings embarrassment to my life? He is the only way to salvation. There is nothing else coming. No good thoughts. Send me good vibes. What is a good vibe? Ain't no good vibe ever healed my body. Send me your good vibes, folks. What, what's a good vibe? We have miracle working power. We have a blood, as they sang, that now 2,000 plus years later has still not lost its power. It still washes the sinner clean. It still justifies the ungodly. It still saves the sinner. It's, it's, it's power, saints. Don't you understand? Everything we have is power. The gospel is power. The Holy Ghost is power. The blood is power. Everything we got is power. And it's power that this world does not possess. It's, a, it's power that this world cannot duplicate. It's power that this world cannot replicate. It is power that is left alone to the blood-bought, born-again children of the living God. And I believe firmly that the reason why this country is going into such deep immorality is because the church of Jesus Christ became an entertainment center for the morally obligated instead of an evangel evangelical tool that Christ could use to declare the gospel to every broken, hurting, and rebellious person that would live. You see, this is nothing new. They were trying to produce this in the 1980s. Back even into the 1960s, 70s, 80s. But at that time, God raised up a movement called the Moral Majority. And the world hated them because they cried out against abortion. But they were, I mean, it was a massive movement. The world hated them because they cried out against homosexuality. But it was a massive movement. Because they were unified believers. And they knew their God. And I'm going to tell you, Daniel 11 tells me that at the end of this age, that there's going to be a remnant of believers that will not be ashamed or intimidated. They will not be driven back or they will not be derailed. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and they will do exploits. It is going to be a church of un parallel power and it doesn't matter what the devil does the devil will not be able to hide us because in the deepest darkest night we shall be a city set on a hill that cannot be hid remember children of God we are the light of the world and people say well if God wants to save them he'll save them if Jesus wants them to be saved they'll be saved but remember Jesus said as long as I'm in the world People say, well, Jesus is the light of the world. That's not what it says. That's contextually incorrect. Hear what he said. He said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. But he is no longer here. So he gives them the same commission. And he says, ye are the light of the world. I'm leaving now. Now you be the light of the world. We are the light of the world, saints. No one, no one will be illuminated in this world. I don't care how much they think they are enlightened. The only thing that can illuminate them is the word of God. The only thing that can bring true light to them is the church of Jesus Christ. Because we are, we are, everybody say we are the light of the world. We are. You are light. And you let somebody be in darkness and becoming weary of that darkness. And you'd be surprised how much they appreciate you when they see the light. I want us to take this supper with all appreciation, seriousness, but also celebration. 
Because this represents the very act that Christ committed himself to in order to free me from the bondages of iniquity. How many of y'all are free tonight? You were bound. Oh, that song, I was bound by a life of sin and shame. I mean bound. Absolutely hopeless to be free. And had it not been, we used to sing that song years ago, had it not been, for a place called Mount Calvary. Had it not been for an old rugged cross, Lord, had it not been for a man called Jesus, then forever my soul would be lost. So had it not been for a place called Mount Calvary, and had it not been for the old rugged cross, and had it not been for a man called Jesus, good God, then forever my soul would be lost, because had it not been For a place called Mount Calvary. And had it not been for the old rugged cross. And had it not been for a man called Jesus. Then forever my soul would be lost. Do you believe that? Had it not been for a place called Mount Calvary. And had it not been for the old rugged cross. And had it not been. For a man called Jesus, then forever my soul would be lost. That ought to create a deep appreciation in you. Because had it not been for a place called Mount Calvary, And had it not been for the old rugged cross. And had it not been for a man called Jesus. Then forever my soul would be lost. Had it not been, saints, we'd still be addicts. Had it not been, we'd still be alcoholics. Had it not been, we'd still be dabbling in perversion. Had it not been, we would still be depressed and anxious. Had it not been, saints of God, we would still be thieves and liars, gossips and slanderers. Had it not been for this man called Jesus, this son of the living God, this spotless lamb of God, Forever, a soul would be lost. So when I sing that song, it just goes deep down in my soul. Because had it not been for a place called Mount Calvary, and had it not been for the old rugged cross, and had it not been For a man called Jesus, then forever my soul would be lost. One more time, had it not been for a place called Mount Calvary. And had it not been for the old rugged cross. And had it not been 
for a man called Jesus. Then forever my soul would be lost. Laverne, put that graphic up that I made if you would. This was so powerful to me. Not that one. There should be one under messages. Oh, had it not been for a place called Mount Calvary. I love this right here because it bridged it. This great chasm that man could not. We could not overcome it, Brother Jonathan. No, no matter how much strength or effort or ingenuity we would have put into it, we would have never crossed this chasm. It was impossible. The barrier of sin in the flesh was so thick and strong. That there's no way we could have gotten to God. But then the cross comes. And it bridges the divide. And where once we could not get to God. In fact, even in Israel, they had to use a high priest. Now you and I can go boldly before the throne of grace to find help and to make our petition known in the time of need. Saints, had it not been, none of this would be possible. Monique came up, and I hope she don't mind if I share this, but she said, Pray for me because about this time is when I start to become distracted. And she has no clue. What did I tell you yesterday? Chandra, what have we talked about? The Lord told me on Tuesday. He said, don't you dare get distracted now. That's what I told you, wasn't it? Both of y'all, I told y'all that. Don't you get distracted now. The enemy's going to come with everything in your life. Everything, and, and, and it's not always going to be evil. It's not always going to be ungodly. It's not always going to be immoral. Anything that the enemy can bring to your life to hold out in front of you to keep you distracted. Because saints of God, at the end of the day, heaven and earth will pass away. At the end of the day, money's going to be burned up with. Don't go pursuing money. Don't do it. I'm telling you right now. Make a living. Provide for your family. But don't let the enemy dangle the carrot in front of you. Because your money is about to be as worthless as you can imagine it to be. I'm telling you as fast, as fast as you can. We're going to turn around here in just a little bit, saints. And the yen is going to be overtaking the dollar. Oh, I got to make more money. The Bible said men will take their money and Cast it to the fowls of the air because it will mean nothing. This is a life. The work of God is life. Don't get distracted by issues in your homes because if the enemy knows that all he's got to do is unsettle your house and that will be what distracts you, he's going to unsettle your house. Don't worry about problems on the job because of it. All it takes is problems on the job to unsettle your life and to cause you to be distracted. You'll be distracted. Sister Monique got into an accident this morning on her way to school. If that's what the enemy has to do, he'll distract you. If it looks like health problems, he'll distract you. Keep your face set like a flint and carry on, children of God, to the end of this thing. We are drawing close to the end. I'm telling you. I am no prophet of doom, but I'm telling you, I can see it right now. We are going back to the days of Noah. The sin and the iniquity is so strong and ungodly and unholy. It is vile. I'm talking men are unchecked now. Now, There is no moral conscience anymore. They're taking out every bit of consciousness out of your children's life out of the out of the out of the out of the the, the the society in which you live media and television and movies and TV shows are just absolutely 
pummeling away at the conscience. It's pummeling away at the moral conscience that God put inside a man until man has had their conscience seared with a hot iron until everything is okay. And the Bible said, woe unto them when they begin to call good evil and they begin to call evil good. We are wrapping this thing up. Jesus is going to come back again. So don't let anything outside of the church of Jesus Christ, outside of the truth of his word, be your passion, be your pursuit, be your vision, but keep your eyes on Jesus Christ and hold on. I've seen people leave this church pursuing the almighty dollar and lost their soul. They lost themselves. They thought, I said, I'm telling you guys, I, I prophesied to them. I said, if you do this, you're going to lose it. Oh, no, I got a strong relationship with Jesus. That'll never happen. A couple of years later, everything's falling apart in their life. Remember the word. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. God and his righteousness and all these things. And when he's talking about things, he's talking about food and raiment, clothing and housing. These things shall all be added unto you. All you got to do is seek him first. Well, I want it. Hey, what is that? Uh, that that, that uh, attorney commercial. Well, it's my money and I want it now. That's not how God works. God works in seasons. Everything you stored up, God has to you. If you wait for it, it'll come to you. If you out pursue God, it is going to fall at your feet and everything God had for you will be diminished into nothing. Amen. I have had it, saints. I'm telling you, the devil has dangled that distraction out in front of me. Well, if you'll go elsewhere, you'll have bigger, better, greater. God said, oh, pump the brakes, son. Pump the brakes. Because what I have for you, it's for you. Ain't nobody else going to get it. Ain't nobody else going to get it. What I have for you is for you. And when it's the right time, I'll give it to you. But don't outrun me. Don't outrun me. Hold on. I'll give it to you in time. And I have now been preaching this gospel for 25 years. I have been in pastoral ministry for over 20 years. And I'm going to tell you, I haven't seen that day all the way yet. But I know that God who has promised is able to perform it. And I'm not about to go out and pursue something that will end up being me by the flesh trying to strong arm. But if I would just yield to the Lord, he would just give to me freely. And I'm going to tell you, there will be sorrow with it. There will be sorrow. There will be sorrow. You will find yourself miserable. You will find yourself weeping in sorrow. But if we'll just hold on, children of God, amen. I'm going to go out and get me a man. I'm going to go out and get me a woman. I'm going to go out and do this. The blessing of the Lord maketh rich and addeth no sorrow to it. When God comes to give you what he has to you, it will be the blessing of your lifetime and you won't have to worry about it. It's mine and I want it now. You are not a spoiled child. You're not a brat. You don't have to act like that. You just be patient and watch God bless your socks off. You just hold on and watch God do things for you that nobody thought possible for you because if we're not careful we'll pursue what we want and then when we get it we will say look what I have gained look what I have gained I know a man right now who's miserable because he had to prove something to everybody around him and he went and got all he wanted but he has nothing he needs why would you do something like that when you can just hold on and let the blessing of the Lord overtake you it was all because I had to be vindicated. My detractors were wrong about me. I have proven myself now. I am successful. There was a man like that in the Bible. And he was a great king. And he forgot that God gave him all that he had. And he walked around his kingdom looking at all he had built. And he said, look what I have done. Look what I have built. Look at this kingdom. I have done that with my hands. And God came to him. 
I said, because you forgot that I gave that to you. You'll now, like a beast, crawl around on your hands and your knees, and you will eat straw like the ox. And that man became a wild animal, eating the grass from the ground. Couldn't even talk. Completely psychotic and out of his mind. Because, saints, you don't have to do anything to prove anything to anyone when you become a believer. All you have to do is be obedient. And he said, in the willing and obedient, I will eat of the good of the land. You and I have access to all of that. Amen. You ever pursued somebody you thought was it? Man, you fought with all your might. That's it. Only to have to go, oh, God, I should have just waited. I should have just held on. Amen. You can do it, saints. You can do it. So for whoever this is, hold on. Your blessing's coming. Your blessing's coming. And when it comes, it will overtake you. Amen. Some people come from families where they have to prove themselves to their families. I can't be the black sheep. I can't be the one without. So I've got to prove to them. I've got to, I've got to prove to them that I won't be the one that I've got to prove. Stop all of that. You've been born again. You have nothing to prove to anyone. You are no longer that family. You are now the family of God. And all you have to do is be obedient now to your father. And the willing and obedient I will cause to eat of the good of the land. Because at the end of the day, I will not stand before my dad and he say, oh, I had an uncle that did that to his son one time. And I thought, oh, God, it's blasphemy. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That will do nothing for me. It won't give me entrance into his kingdom. It may make me feel proud for a moment. But when I stand before the king eternal, and because of this sacrifice, because I yielded to it, because I let the blood of Jesus and the spirit of God and the word of God work in my life, I'm going to hear him say, well done. Oh, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over these few things. Now enter into the joy of the Lord. I'm going to give you ten cities and five cities. Good God in heaven. So if you feel the pressure to prove a point to people, stop it. Just please the Lord. Just please the Lord. And God will be glorified in your life. Now we're going to take over this supper. And I want you to remember that everything we've talked about tonight was made possible because of a hill called Mount Calvary, because of an old rugged cross, and because of a man called Jesus. Because he was beaten and broken, brutalized, where I should have been the one to take on that punishment. He took upon himself the iniquity of us all. And that brutal sacrifice became exactly what was necessary so that I would stand before God justified. It, it satisfied, Brother Chris, the vengeance of God. It satisfied the wrath of God so that I could be partakers of the spirit and the blessing. This is what this is all for. So you could be free. So that now you have a testimony that you were that. But now you have been born again. When we take of this great supper, I want you children of God to have a profound appreciation in your heart. Because he told them, this is my body which is broken for your sake. As often as you take this bread, and you do drink this cup, you do show the death of the Lord till he comes. He said, do it in remembrance of me. Whew. 
I don't know about you, but I could never forget. Hallelujah. After all he's done for me, I could never forget. Amen. Come on, brothers. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. The Bible tells us that that night that Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for your sake. For my sin, my iniquity, my rebellion, my stubbornness, my hard-headedness, this was his body that was broken for me, that with his stripes I could be healed. And then when he gave them of the cup to drink, he said, this is my blood. It's a new covenant. Because had we still been bound uh, under the old covenant, none of us have access to the promises of God. We're still strangers, aliens. None, None of us. None of us have hope. But he shed his blood and he tore down the middle wall of partition. And he forever bridged the gap for every man to be able to come to the throne of God, and that was with his blood. He signed a new covenant with us, and this covenant was not legalistic. This covenant was a covenant of faith, and no longer would we have to be bound and just a show of will worship, but we could be free from sin and iniquity. I mean, literally free to where we no longer do it anymore. We no longer are bound by it anymore. We just go on free from it. That was the new covenant he signed in his blood. And he said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show my death till I come. And the apostle warns us not to do this unworthily, but to do it soberly. This is not a snack. This is a deep celebration and remembrance of the Lord's death till he comes. So let's stand to our feet and we will pray. We'll bless this. Oh God, we thank you so much for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary. We thank you, Lord, that this bread represents your body, which was broken for our sake. Your body broken so that ours could be healed. Your body broken so that ours could be made whole. Father, I pray that anyone that partakes of this supper tonight, God, if there's any sickness in their body, any disease in their body, Lord, any disease in their mind, sickness in their heart, God, sickness of sin and iniquity, Lord, that by your stripes, by your broken body, you would heal them tonight. We thank you so much for the sacrifice. We thank you, Lord, because we know if it wasn't for this, we are all still hopeless and without God. So we bless this bread, and we ask that you would use this moment for the glory of God, that many would be healed and delivered. And we pray over this cup, God, which is the blood of the New Testament. We thank you, Lord, that we got to come in now. The Jews had accesses to the, access to the promises of God. We absolutely had no access at all. But your blood, Lord, shed for our redemption. Your blood shed for the remission of our sins. Your blood, Lord, wrote a new covenant for us. That whether Jew or Gentile, bond or free, Greek or barbarian, Lord, we all now have access to go boldly before the throne of grace to make our petition known, to find help in the time of need. So we bless this cup. Lord, we do this in remembrance of you. We do this in gratitude for the sacrifice that you made for us. Oh, God, bless this time with your presence. Shower us with your anointing and help us to take this, Lord, with a worthy heart. That if there be any here, God, that would need to confess their sin, that would there be any here that would need to ask forgiveness of iniquity, that they would take this moment right now. Cleanse us, Lord, so that when we take this cup, we do it, God, with a sincerity and soberness, 
that it is worthy of. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. was rich I remember who I was I was lost I was blind I was running out of time sin separated the breach was far too wide but from the far side of the chasm you held me in your side so you Drawn me 
Saints, Sunday's coming. It's Wednesday, but Sunday's coming. And, and I believe that God is going to do a powerful work in this place on Sunday morning. Invite your friends, your family, your loved ones. And for those that may have not been able to partake of this supper, if you are here Sunday and you would like to, uh, if you're watching, please let me know. And uh, we'll make sure we set it aside for you uh, on Sunday morning after the service. But thank God for the blood. Thank God for the blood. And thank God for the broken body of Jesus Christ that has made us whole. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you. May the Lord grant you peace in the mighty name of Jesus. May you go with God and may God use you as a powerful witness to the glory of God, that others may also come running, saying, what must I do to be saved? Have a great week. God go with you. Let's come back here Sunday with expectation and anticipation. The music department will be practicing after cleaning. Cleaning will be at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning. So let's all come and be a part of what God's doing. Amen. God bless you guys. So you made a way.